you know, I think anything that you can do that takes you out of your comfort zone, that's where you, that's where growth is. A DJ, TV presenter and radio host who found fame on Channel 4's BAFTA award-winning Made in Chelsea. After her first TV audition, she was advised not to give up her day job, which she proudly ignored and is now a regular face in the British media. Not only a highly sought-after DJ, accomplished television presenter and popular model, she is also an articulate social commentator, activist and empowerment coach. But what she's most passionate about is using a platform for good, realising a responsibility to raise awareness for the causes closest to her heart and campaigning for body positivity, mental health and social media honesty. Please enjoy this week's Escape Your Limits podcast with Ashley Louise James. So me and my brother wanted to ask you a question. Do you want to ask that? Yeah. So my question is, who inspired you to be like a DJ? Um, it's a good question. Do you know, no one in particular, like there's not one particular DJ, but I've just always loved music and I really believe that whatever you're interested in, you should follow and try and do it for a living because then it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. Yeah, because I would do that too because we both like music a lot. We would be singing in the car and so we'd be like, yay! Then you should do it. I feel like, um, I feel like, yeah, you don't always need to like follow someone else's path. That's why I like to do a little bit of DJing, a little bit of music, a little bit of television, just whatever I'm interested in. Yeah. And I had a question. What's the best advice for anyone who's watching this for like advice for their career that they wanted to start? I mean, it's a very good question. I suppose the best advice is, if you're passionate about something, pursue it and don't worry about having knockdowns or rejection because a lot of the time, especially the more, the bigger that you dream, a lot of people don't see your vision or understand what you want to do and you come across people who might not see it. Yeah. So no matter how many setbacks and how much rejection you get, just keep going. Yeah, just follow your dreams. Yeah. Thank you for answering that question. That's okay. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. I will. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. So Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. I hear, I hear you've just got back from France. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, just about a week ago. I'm ready for another trip. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was that in lockdown? I, I, I've uh, heard there's, there's, there's challenges to, to travel in Europe. Um, I was, we, we were planning to be back there in, uh, for our summer holidays. But was, it, was it okay to move around? Um, do you know what? It was actually okay. Like we we didn't go out until the guidelines said we could, and um, we drove pretty much from door to door. So it was a long twelve hour round trip, but um, it was worth it as soon as we got there. You know, I did lockdown in a small two bedroom flat in the middle of London, so um, it was nice to have some green space and just be in the middle of nowhere and get looked after by my boyfriend's parents. And um, yeah, you. I think I didn't realise how much I needed a break post lockdown until I was actually away. Yeah, yeah. What, what's what's the feeling with with people? Like, are they? I know certainly here you kind of have people frown upon you if you're sort of going out and and being normal. Is it? And I suppose with someone like you that's in the public eye, do do you have people that are sort of um, you know questioning? Oh, you know, she's going on holiday, and how do you how do you deal with that kind of stuff? <laughs> yeah, I think with anything you do, understandably, there's people that agree and people who don't agree, and I suppose that's the same in life. But unfortunately, a lot of people like to give their opinions whether they agree or not. And um, I mean, do you know what? I think with COVID, I can understand why people might be afraid or why people might be hesitant to go away and I can even understand why people think it's the wrong decision to go away so um, I guess it's just about not taking it too personally and also remembering that whilst we're all kind of in the same storm we're in very different boats so you know for me especially being pregnant it was just very important for us to get out there and to have that kind of like green outside space to be around family um, and obviously, as a, someone who is high risk, to do it in the safest way possible. And actually, whilst I can see that it sounds um, irresponsible, so to speak, crossing different countries whilst there's like a global pandemic, we also 
were in um, direct contact with much less people out in rural France than we were in central London. So I think it's just down to individuals and being sensible. Mm. You, you're, you're very strong on, on social media and um, I guess that's a new space in itself. But how have you found the, the, the I guess, you know, over the last sort of four or five months how, how, what's it been like on social media has it been a different place i i've got friends that have that have you know again fairly sort of uh, prominent in that world and and they've they've been so scared even to post something you know being afraid to how that would affect their dim image or their personal brand have you found it's been quite a a, a struggle to navigate through that or, or what's your plans been <laughs> Do you know what? The, my take on social media for me personally is always to be authentic. I feel like whenever I'm not authentic, it just doesn't sit right with me. And that means kind of it, sometimes leaving my ego at the door. There's certain posts that I do, especially around like body confidence that I know if I'm showing my body in an unflattering angle, that will get more likes than just a normal picture. But I try to not let my ego and my desire for likes kind of take away my authenticity. So I think in terms of lockdown, it was just about adapting to like my change in life, but also being more conscious about other people's change in circumstances as well. So showing the rough with the smooth, reminding people that it's not all plain sailing, you know, showing failed attempts at cooking or you know all the new things that you're trying to do to stay afloat I guess it for me it was important to show that number one it wasn't all plain sailing but number two things that I was doing in order to cope or pass the time or stay positive um but I definitely think you know for I can understand why there would be fear with posting because I think there's been a lot of things on not just with the pandemic but obviously with the Black Lives Matter movement and um lots of other really important issues that have kind of come to the surface this year. So I, I do understand that it's maybe a more, I, would, I don't want to say difficult space to navigate, but I think audiences are just wanting more authenticity and more realism, which kind of works for me because that's, you know, how I thrive. Mm. I guess it, 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 there's a real fine line because I suppose whilst it can really build your brand and and, and accelerate your career, it also if you, I suppose if you misunderstand a situation, I've, I've sort of seen examples where people have probably said something for the right reasons, but maybe worded, worded it incorrectly or it's come across wrong. That you can you know you can destroy years worth of uh, of work, I guess, even if you are being <laughs> genuinely authentic. Yeah, I guess yes and no, because I think um, I think there is that kind of fear of cancel culture. But um, I guess there's something like beautiful in owning your mistakes almost because, you know, none of us were born woke. None of us were born with an understanding of every different type of um, marginalized society. So I think there is like a beauty in being able to hold your hands up and be like, Do you know what, I got that wrong. And I, I'm going to put the work in to be better. Um, I think, you know, it is a bit of a like scary environment where people are very quick to pick up on your mistakes. And people love to watch people fall, especially the higher up you get. But I think that people are also very forgiving to people who put their hands up. I think, you know, even in terms of like looking at the UK government, I think they would have there would have been people who were much more forgiving had they just held their hands up and said, we got this wrong or, you know, Dominic Cummings held his hands up and being like, do you know what? I shouldn't have driven to Durham during lockdown. And um, so I, I do think people just don't like it when things get brushed over or when people are too afraid to admit a mistake and apologize mm. for it. Mm. Is that the truth from your view? Like you're a very different I, I guess I could be your father. <laughs> Maybe mm. so, sounds quite scary, but I guess in you know with I suppose younger people that I'm, you know, I'm talking, you know, probably twenty odd years younger than me. Is that really you know nowadays? Is that the thing that you know? Because I suppose in the past, particularly in media, you would um, you know you would say something and you would stick to it and you would never ever sort of talk about okay, I've I've, I've made a mistake. But do, do you think nowadays, as a I guess as a young entrepreneur and an and influencer? to sort of use that word but um you know is, is that really what people want nowadays it's just like look I've, this is what i thought today i've looked at it it's different i've made a mistake you know hold my hand up and, and come out and say that is that what what you think people are after now do you know what i'd say that i'm like a generation above like the the real young kind of tiktok generation i'm obviously in, in my early 30s so i'd say i'm oh. a m millennial <laughs> Whereas um, I think now we've passed the reins to Gen Z. But certainly for me, I think that 
people are less, I don't want to say ignorant, that's not the right word because I'm not saying people in the past were ignorant, but it's harder to hide with the internet because the truth always comes out. Whereas maybe in the past, that kind of smoke and mirrors, lies, politics, manipulation, like you could probably get away with it. But in the the very fast paced world we live in, like you just have to look at, you know, like huge cases like Jimmy Savile, Jeffrey Epstein, um, you know, even Donald Trump, this the, the Russian report, all of these things, they're showing that it's kind of impossible to make mistakes and to lie and to hide because people just see straight through it. Mm. How do you, like you, you, you're in the TV and the media quite a lot. Um, how do you, you sort of um, manage the, 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 the truth from, I, su- I suppose the media from what I see, and I'm not in that world, but you know, it's, it's about clicks and grabbing attention and spinning stories. And I suppose nowadays with this being so much competition in that space, you, you know, the, 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 the exaggerations and the headlines seem to need to get bigger and bigger. How, how do you, as a consumer of this stuff, you know, particularly when the world's in a, a crazy place at the moment, how do you navigate and get the truth from people who are just, you know, selling you on, on clicking on a, on a link, for example? Do you know what? It's a good question. And I think it's something that a lot of people in my industry are afraid of, you know, saying the wrong thing and then it being this kind of clickbait headline. But I guess it's just understanding that it's not just reacting to a headline, especially as a consumer, because, you know, I sometimes see um, headlines about myself and think like, oh, my God, I would hate me. (laughs) But I know that 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 thing is taken out of context. So I suppose it's just like being a bit more considered and not always reacting to a clickbait and actually sometimes when you read further into the article you're like oh it's not actually that there's actually a bit of context to it um so yeah I suppose they're very clever in that they know what to say to get you to click on the article but you just have to kind of like read it through and also I think it's consuming different types of media sources as well just so that you're getting a bit of a balanced view you know I like to think that I'm quite liberal in a lot of my views but I do try and kind of like read a sort of more right-wing paper as well just I think you know it's important to try and understand both points even if sometimes some of the points seem very irrational Mm, yeah is it is it a case like I I guess I know you've been on on a number of programs and and uh, uh, over over your career and I suppose do you do do you experience where you kind of get built up and suddenly you you know you're very popular and then suddenly it's like okay now we're going to kind of you know level it down and how do you sort of deal with that as a as an individual is it do you have to be sort of fairly tough skinned to just ignore what what's being written about you or what, what's your strategy for sort of dealing with that do you know what it is so I first um I did my first reality tv show in 2012 which is obviously a long time ago now eight years and I think um it's kind of understanding that number one you can't put your happiness on people liking you. You can't like look for validation. And I guess this is in any walk of life, regardless whether you're in like the public eye or not. When your whole happiness depends on validation from others, it means that you have the huge highs, but you also have the lows because people can come and pull the rug under you. And so it's trying to understand that you need to A, be authentic because you can't just do things for likes because then there's also going to be a time where you get pulled down. So I always say people might not always like my opinion, but at least I can like put my heart behind my opinions. And I try not to give them if I'm not educated enough to give them. I'll be like, do you know what? I need to learn more about this before I give my, like before I can give a solid opinion. Um, But I think it's also realizing that like fame and money and all the things that I thought would bring me so much happiness, they are actually not the answer. Like, you know, there's some amazing experiences and yes, money can buy you experience, but a lot of the like richest people I've met or the most famous people I've met, they're miserable because they're still kind of like chasing validation and nobody is, you know, the number one nation's heartthrob or whatever it is for life. And when you're just chasing that, it's actually a very lonely road. Um, And I think the other thing is not being scared to be who you are. Like I did Celebrity Big Brother in 2018 and it was to celebrate the year of the woman. So it was all these like strong but very different women and men who entered into the house. And I remember being in there thinking like, 
I just want people to like me. Why does that person not like me? Why does that person not like me? And it was actually when I struck up a very unlikely friendship with Anne Widdicombe, who and she said to me, Ashley, you're so nice and you're so intel intelligent, but you're so sensitive and you worry more about what people think of you than what your actual opinion is or what you think of yourself. And it like really struck a chord with me. And I'm that's why now I'm like, do you know what? Having an opinion doesn't make you a bad person. And actually, you get so much more out of life when you stop kind of like living by trying to make everyone happy because you're never going to make someone happy. And especially if you go onto a platform like Twitter, <laughs> I could go on Twitter and be like, I love apples. And people will tweet back, like, well, what about bananas? Why, why don't you like bananas? And so if you're constantly trying to make everybody happy, either online or offline, it's just exhausting. Mm. It seems like, I've, like just before we started, my children um, asked some questions and, you know, they, they like... Um, filming and editing and um you know I, I can see we've obviously kept them off sort of social media but you could see very soon that it's going to be difficult to hold that back but you know let, particularly for young women which I, I guess you know you can relate to do, do you think it's difficult that even if you're not a celebrity but you've got a friend you know friend group on on social media to to be able to to be yourself and and to you know when a lot of these are geared around getting likes and acceptance from people. And if you do a video or a post and it doesn't get likes, then that hits your, your ego. Am I good enough? Do I look good enough? And these sorts of things. You know, what, what, can, what advice can you give to sort of young females that, uh, that, that are dealing with that kind of stuff at the moment? You know, you, you, you had someone like Anne Widdicombe that made a comment that obviously clicked with you. But I guess it's more than just a, a statement to sort of make that shift mentally. What, what What's your views or advice you can give to people? I'd say that my number one advice is that social media can be like the best place on earth or the worst place on earth. And we actually control what we, um, what we see. So I'd say anyone that makes you feel jealous, sad, envious, any kind of negative emotion, like unfollow those people, or if they're your friends, mute those people, because you actually don't need to see. And I think, especially if you're spending a lot of time on social media, you can kind of really get go down a wormhole of comparison culture, which isn't healthy for anyone. And I think it actually hinders creativity, because rather than you doing what you like, or what excites you or what inspires you you're kind of trying to copy what other people do which is what I used to do as well and the problem is if you're copying someone you're not actually being an entrepreneur or you're not being interesting and it was once I stopped editing pictures and you know trying to find a white background and all of those things that my following started to to grow and I think that's because other people are online feeling exactly the same as we are um, and they crave authenticity and they crave other people that like the same things as them and that isn't always the mainstream thing that you think you should like um but I will reiterate the point that it is okay to unfollow and mute people even if you like them in real life <laughs> I, I've seen you've had some pretty harsh comments um I've you know over the, the years and doing my research how how does that make you feel like it can't make you feel good but how, how does that make you feel and what do you do when you get one of those do you just have a way of deleting it in your mind or do you go and retaliate do you know what I think it really depends on what frame of mind I'm in at the time that I read it so that's why I try not to go on social media if I'm like in a particularly low point and I think especially for people in any creative field there's times where we feel like yes we're on top of the world we can do anything and there's times where we're like maybe I'm not good enough and all those kind of like niggling self-doubts come in so if you're going through one of those like self-doubt or kind of like low self-esteem moments and then you're suddenly on Instagram and again I suppose that's when you're more likely to be chasing validation so you need those likes or you need those nice comments it's also when a really horrible comment might really sting mm -hmm. um so I guess it's like protecting your own space and knowing that if you're having a bad day be like do you know what I'm just going to park social media for today and I'm going to do something that makes me feel good or go to the park put music on watch a series whatever it is that makes you happy um mm. and then um I guess the other thing is realizing there's a really good quote that says you might be the ripest juiciest peach but some people just don't like peaches <laughs> and I think that's what you have to remember that you're not for everyone like no one is for everyone and also the people that are for everyone are maybe like living a bit more of a vanilla cautious life like I don't think 
everybody wants to be liked but actually when you think about it there's a lot of people that you don't like and you just kind of stay away from them so I think the easiest thing to do is when you do see those people that clearly don't understand you or make you feel defensive or like you have to justify it's just like blocking those people so that they don't need to upset themselves by seeing what you're up to and you don't need to see that um but then when it comes to the more kind of like male derogatory comments I normally do call them out publicly just because I like to think that someone a female from their circles might see that and it might or it might publicly humiliate make publicly humiliate them which might make them think twice before they comment on a negatively on a stranger's appearance just because I'm very like conscious that for me I've got to a point where people's opinions don't really bother me as much as they used to but for some people especially like a lot of the young girls that come out of love island on a like you know their level of fame is astronomical because on in the days when maiden chelsea was big social media wasn't really around so we weren't getting everyone's opinions about every single thing we did and you know a lot of these girls are so young and it's so new and exciting and they have that kind of gratification and again that validation that Mm. it's um a lot of a lot of like you know negative comments can have a real like devastating impact on them Mm, yeah i i I guess yeah from a mental health perspective i I, i'm sure it can and i've never thought put that those two together but it's interesting Mm -hmm. you mention it that you know maybe when you are feeling not great about yourself and down and and then you go onto social media looking for that validation that's probably the last thing that you probably want to do during those times so i think that's an interesting um observation and you know one for us all to 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 probably be aware of because you're not going to get it from from some sort of app on your phone you know you need to look at other areas for that so where do you go to you know where where do you go to sort of sent I, I suppose to be centered and and to sort of reconnect with yourself with um you know with a, a very busy career and, and and life you know do you meditate do you work out what, what's your sort of safe space and um, so definitely working out i think um my journey with exercise has changed over the years the more that i've um grown self-love so i now see exercise as like this really like positive way to move my body to shake off my headspace and I think it's that difference of seeing something of like I can't wait to move my body I can't wait to go boxing because I love it as opposed to being like oh I need to punish myself because I ate a Jaffa cake or whatever it is so um definitely exercise I've got a little dog called Snoop who's he's never he's never far away um but I'll go to the park with him and um I listen to the car map a lot which is um this amazing app it's basically What's tells it you bedtime it's called calm calm okay um so they it's basically a lot of um famous faces with very great voices telling you bedtime stories <laughs> um but they have like morning meditation that's calming music and then i think as well just listening to music can completely shift your mood because if you have a happy playlist or you have like I don't know, a calming playlist or whatever it is, no matter what you're feeling in that time, as soon as you put your favourite song on or the songs that you listen to on holiday with your best mates or whatever it is, your whole mood can completely transform. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm the same. I, I, I unconsciously do that, but I, um, you know, stick my earphones on and that just um, <laughs> it takes me to a, a different place than what I'm in. So, one of the things I was, you mentioned fitness and and that you've you've changed um, I suppose your relationship with yourself um, and and I know you know following you on on social media you, you talk a lot about sort of body positivity and accepting your flaws and and, and accepting you know what 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 you've been given what what's your views on um, I suppose how to accept yourself where you know maybe you probably aren't in the best health, let's say. And, and, you know, I know a lot of times the correlation between health and how you look physically is, is, is connected, but what, what's your views and what, what's your, your position on, um, I suppose, accepting who you are, um, and what your body is, but also being aware, maybe if you're not actually sort of, you know, not as healthy as you could be, maybe you're, you, you know, you, you're making yourself happy, but you're eating junk food and you're maybe not exercising as you should do to sort of develop your immunity. How, how do you, it's a very fine line and I don't want to upset anyone, but how do you sort of balance those, those two of being accepting, but also re- recognizing that you probably do need to be a little bit more healthier for your own sake? 
Well, I think it all comes down to self-love and also taking the pressure off, realising that your physical appearance actually will not change your happiness if you are in a bad frame of mind. Because even when I've been at like my skinniest or my most toned, um, or I've exercised and eaten healthy to the point of ex obsession, I never actually sat back and enjoyed it because it was never enough. Um, so I think it's understanding that you can be underweight you can be overweight uh you can overindulge you can under underindulge and i also think that when you're in that cycle of counting calories and having a cheat day or having a treat for me personally that's kind of asking to kind of fall off the ladder and fail or because everything is like either a treat or a punishment or a so I think it's just trying to understand like what is best for me and that like for me physically also is mentally like it's it's exactly the same so if I know for example if this week I don't do any exercise my mental health isn't going to be good so it's actually less about the physical side of it although of course once we get into that flow of moving our bodies and eating well we naturally do start to look better but I think it's just having that kind of healthy approach and also not obsessing over how someone else's body looks. Because I used to have, you know, whoever it would be, maybe like Emily Ratajowski, I think she's called on my phone as my screensaver. And that would be like my fitspiration. Mm -hmm. But actually, we have completely different bills, different bodies. For all I know, she's got like a chef, a personal trainer and all of those unattainable things for me and my lifestyle and my finances. So now I actually, I, I try not to like obsess over the external um result mm -hmm. which isn't to say that that will work for some people because some people actually want to see that physical result and i understand that but i think for me it was all about accepting myself how i how i am stopping seeing physical exercise as something as punishment stopping seeing pizza and cakes and biscuits or cheese or whatever it is is something I have as a cheat or a treat or something that's naughty and actually once I like broke that cycle and changed my mindset I actually I could leave a pack of biscuits in um, the cupboard for like three months because I don't think about it because I'm not like I'm not depriving myself of them at any time therefore I'm not mm. going to stuff my face with them on a Saturday because I can like they're just there and it's available mm. um, do you think do you think sometimes that that mental pressure on, as you say, you know, it's either a punishment or a reward, that pressure in itself drives the behaviours of you going from one side and the other because you're not necessarily happy with yourself. And if you are more acceptance that that leads to the habits and behaviours and the results that you're actually looking for. Um, so, you know, you will naturally kind of get whatever that weight or body shape is for you um, and you'll be healthier. Do you, do you think those are connected then in your experience? Yeah, because I also think like, you know, back in the days where I do like, right, from Monday, I'm going to go on a diet. From Monday, I'm going to go to the gym every day. So I'd go from like doing almost nothing or next to nothing to suddenly being like, right, Monday, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So then I'd wake up and I'd eat like fruit instead of cereal. So what that would mean is an hour later, I'd be starving. So I'm automatically thinking about food because instead of having like porridge with nuts and whatever it is, something that is actually going to like keep me full for longer. But like, God forbid I have porridge because that wouldn't, you know, it'd be like beige and the wrong color. And uh, so now if I have porridge, I don't even think about food until lunchtime because it, I've like had enough. My body doesn't want any more. So I think when you're in that cycle of trying to limit your intake or cut out the carbs, whatever it is, it actually makes you think about the thing you're trying to avoid more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the same with exercise. If suddenly you're like, right, I'm going to go to the gym every day and you're going and running on a treadmill or doing something that you don't really like, but you're like, but I need to get fit. I need to lose weight. I'm going on holiday. You're not actually in, enjoying that process of moving your body and you're actually associating physical exercise with like punishment or something that you don't enjoy. Whereas once you actually think about, okay, so what do I like? And for me, that's, I don't know, going boxing, which I haven't been able to do and like punching a punch bag. And that's so great for my mental health because everything I'm angry about, whether it's like an ex-boyfriend or something that a friend said or whatever it might be, I'm just there punching. And, you know, like you're kind of, yes, you're like losing weight or burning calories or whatever it is, but it doesn't feel like you're not doing it for that. You're doing it because you enjoy it and it makes you feel good after. Mm. I think that's a unique perspective. And, you know, we're 
firmly in the fitness industry and you know a lot of the marketing is very much body shape related you know even we've probably been guilty of, of doing that and the, and the whole it seems as though the whole message around health and fitness is that you're going to get a six pack or you're going to get a a nice bum or, or or what have you as, as opposed to i suppose you know as now i'm older and i i used to work out for those reasons now, now i'm older it's I'm, I'm the same you know mentally i'm in a much better place if i've if i've just had you know moved my body started to breathe better got the blood flowing i just perform a lot a lot better um with with i suppose you being in the spotlight and i suppose the first thing that people do is 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 look at you know, they're judging you by how you look and how much, whether you're carrying weight or not. What, what do you think, uh, uh, you know, how do you, how do you think that can change in terms of what people expect, whether you're a model, which, which you've obviously been, or whether you're on TV, how do you, you sort of change that, uh, change that message? Or is it just look, that's what sells, that's what the media does, and you just have to deal with it? I think it's, I think it's just important for anyone in the public eye to give a realistic impression of their body, because I could, punish myself I think things like for example cellulite that's like you know seen as this evil thing that women should avoid but the fact of the matter is I'm a, a UK size 8 I have cellulite and I would have had cellulite whether I starved myself for a week whether I went to the gym and ran on a treadmill every day of the week or you know some things that you just have and I think the the more the higher your profile is or if you're a model or what, you know, whatever it is that you do, there is that pressure to be perfect. But for me, what I realize is if I give off that unrealistic beauty expectation or physical expectation with that, you know, only showing the perfect or airbrush side of myself, I'm also passing down those same insecurities to a younger generation. And, you know, we talked about the physical aspect of it. I've got better abs now than I did when I would go on all these like fad diets because I was like, I'm consistent with it. It's a lifestyle. It's not like this thing that I do before I go on holiday and do it really extremely. It's something that it just fits into my life, you know, like I eat well, I exercise, and as a result, my body looks good. But I don't stress if I've got cellulite. I don't stress if I go to an Italian restaurant and eat pasta. Like, And I think it's just realising that the best way to be in shape or to feel the best that you can feel is to find a way that works in your lifestyle and you know you don't want to deprive yourself of anything because that's when you kind of fall off the wagon or you um you don't keep it up and then mm. you, you have that sense of failure so yeah. I think you know it it's all I think it's not just about showing flaws saying you don't need to be healthy it's saying you can be healthy but you could still have stretch marks you could still have cellulite and you know, you don't need to. You don't need to feel bad about that because even the models have that. And also, a lot of the models are the most insecure people because they are like they are seeing firsthand their bodies being edited. Like I used to get images back of myself, and you know, they've shaved inches off my waist and airbrushed all my skin or airbrushed out stretch marks. And suddenly, I'm like, oh god, they they've had to do that because I'm not perfect. So what can what else can I do to be perfect? And that's why I just think it's important for people in the fitness industry and in the public eye, whatever it is, to kind of show that you can be healthy and go to the gym, but still not look like that kind of photoshopped, polished, um, unrealistic standard that you see online. And I think especially when people obsess over their weight, you know, muscle weighs more than fat. So like, what is weight? Like a weight's just a number, but my weight could be completely different to someone else's weight but I might be in better shape than them it's kind of like a bit of a non thing that we obsess over I think mm, yeah it sounds like a tough business to be in what what um what sort of motivated you to get into um that 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 world I know from if I'm correct I know you was a you, you started off as a sushi chef is that is that right <laughs> no um so I actually I always wanted to be a presenter ever since I was little but I guess it was I just didn't really know um I didn't know it was really an option I thought it was like something that famous people did or like you know special people did I grew up in a small town up north and um so I went to university I did a graduate scheme with Abercrombie and Fitch and then I wanted to go to a company that was more entrepreneurial so that's when I joined ITSU which is owned by Julia Metcalf who set up Pratt so I just kind of wanted to get first-hand experience of 
bit bit working for a company where I could actually make a difference. So obviously you do have to like learn things from the ground up. Um, and it was once being in London for a while that I realized, you know, what my passions were. And I met other people in the industry who were kind of like normal as well. So I was like, well, if they can do it, so can I. And I think, you know, for me, I've never like craved being a celebrity. I've never craved the fame side of it. The goal has always been to follow my passions, which is obviously like working as a presenter and obviously on the music side being a DJ. So at the beginning, I think I did get really like swept into the fame and celeb side of it because it, I saw it as like something that would make you happy or glamorous or suddenly I was being sent all these free clothes and makeup and you know it's like this glamorous world but going back to what I said earlier it's realizing that you know a lot of those things don't actually make you happy or if you you are kind of only happy with the highs there's also a lot of lows and any kind of creative industry I think there's you're opening yourself up for a lot of rejection so you know like with DJing I probably get turned down for more jobs than I get but people on the outside only see the success and I think that's the same for anyone even like starting any form of business you know you people only see the successes but there's always the uh the setbacks as well so you just have to kind of like really believe in what you want to do and don't take anyone's uh if anyone doesn't see your vision, you just keep going in a different way. Mm. What, what was the what was the work like to to get to that stage where you had, you know, the the first break? You know, was it? Did you have to? And again, I've no idea about that world. But did you did you have to sort of work on? Did you have to go and learn how to present and 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 you know develop music skills or whatever? Was it? Was there a lot of work you had to put in to sort of get that first chance? And and is that still part of what you have to do to to stay on the top now? I mean, totally. I think, um, you know, with anything comes a lot of sacrifice that sometimes people don't always see because they only start to know about you once you're starting to get to a certain um, position with it. But um, I mean, I had my kind of like first mini break uh, when I was 16. Um, and by that, I mean, I got uh, my first radio job, but it was just like doing teas and coffees for my local BBC uh, radio station up north but you know that was like my kind of stepping stone and um, I literally just stood outside going do you work here can I have a job can do you work here and I think I did it for about three weeks in the summer holidays until eventually someone was like all right you can make some tea um, and then I did a tv presenting course so when I quit it so I'd like saved enough money to last about two months and I did this um, five-day presenting course and then I sent my CV out to everyone and that's actually how I got introduced to Made in Chelsea because I sent my CV to a production company and then they were like well how about this show and uh, you know I kind of ummed and ahed about it because I was like looking to do more like broadcasting but obviously it was like an appealing opportunity because I had no contacts in the industry I um I only had so much money to last so I was like this is going to get me in front of people it might get me an agent um but the ironic thing about it was that I did a show about these, you know, being really rich, but I was actually so broke because <laughs> I didn't really have any money and I didn't really make any money. And for the first like three years, I was honestly like, I was so broke. I moved out of London. I lived with at a friend's house in his parents' house in Surrey and um, I hustled and I was getting like a lot of rejection and I just had to keep going and keep going. But you know, I missed out on a lot of things. All my friends would be going on holidays or on weekends away or doing all of these things and I couldn't do it, but I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And then even in terms of DJing, I, I've always loved music. Um, I did a lot of like my music theory at school and I sang and um, I'd start going to a lot of events through my work and just like hearing the DJs and thinking like, oh, I could do better. And I used to love clubbing and going to festivals and I just used to always think like oh well I could do that because I could like hear what song should be next or I could hear the BPM so I just um went and actually did a DJ course not because I thought it would be a career just because I thought well it's a cool hobby to have on the side and then I said to my local pub if oh can I use your decks because I couldn't afford to buy some so I was like if, can I use your decks um in exchange for free drinks and they were like yeah so that was my first gig and then at that gig someone was like oh do you have a card like we'd like to book you and it kind of went from there and that's why I always think it's so important just to follow your hobbies because even if I don't know I, f I feel like 
anything you love enough can turn into a career because that's where your passion lies. Mm. When you were younger then, do you think you sort of had this this ambition in you and these things that you wanted to do at a fairly young age or, or was that as a result of, you know, moving to London and just thinking, well, I need to find something to do to make money? Um, no, I think I always had those kind of like passions and that drive, but there was not really any like mentors around that kind of was like, yeah, you could do that. Or yes, it's a, it is an, a career option to be creative. And, um, you know, my dad is a fireman, my mum's a hairdresser and their kind of like big sacrifice was to work two jobs so that we could go to a boarding school. And at the school, it was very much all about like academic, academic. So I think actually I did what I felt I should do by going to university and doing the graduate schemes. Um, and it was only when I got to London and kind of met other creatives and thought like, oh, well, that is a career option then. And, you know, everyone thought I was mad when I quit my job and when I said what I was going to try and do. And, um, you know, my dad still says it when I told him I was doing Celebrity Big Brother. He was like, do you not just want to get a normal job yet? I was like, Dad, this is my job. And, um, <laughs> you know, looking back, I'm so glad that I made that sacrifice because there's so many people I know who, you know, they might be well paid or they might have good what people consider good jobs but they they hate their jobs and they live for the weekends and you know for me work something that we do more than most other things in life and I don't want to get to 60 and think like wow I've enjoyed two days a week mm. for all of those years and so a few years sacrifice missing out on those holidays in my 20s that at the time felt really important like once you actually get to where you want to go and you can like wake up every day and say like I enjoy this or you know it's not all, all plain sailing and sometimes I wish I was like why can't I just do a normal job where I get <laughs> paid holiday and I can turn off but I think you know equally I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for the world and I'd encourage anyone just to keep kind of following their goals and their passions wherever that may be. Mm. I think it's a great story and it's, it's one that I, I guess seems to be you know comes with so much difficulty like you know I, I suppose one being a female is is not you know is is, is different I guess than, than than a you know than a guy um I guess also not coming from a family that is probably in that particular line of industry and you know not necessarily having friends and connections and and then having I guess what's quite an ambitious you know it's almost like oh I want to be on on TV or, or a DJ or whatever, you know, it's one of those, it's a dream and it's one of those things that you kind of secretly keep to yourself, but never believe it can be, it can be possible. But I, I suppose, um, I, 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 and also I guess, you know, with, with your peer group, it's like, well, your family sort of will say, well, go and get a normal job. And then you've got your friends almost like, I suppose it's like, well, you, you know, you're never going to be able to do that. How, how do you, or what advice would you give to, I suppose, your daughter or anyone that, that sort of, I suppose he's scared of dreaming that big. <laughs> Do you know what? It, I think fear is a big one because even when I quit my job at Itsu and I did this presenting course, I remember b being sat in front of my Facebook, which was kind of like the big platform at the time. And on career, I was like changing it to presenter. And I had so much imposter syndrome and I was so worried about what people would think. And I was like, well, I'm not actually a presenter yet because I haven't presented anything. <laughs> And then I was like, but I need to put it out there. And if I'm so worried about what people think, then how on earth am I going to get up on television when the time comes? How on earth? Like, I need people to start seeing me as that. Mm. And, you know, even putting up my show reel for the first time, I was like, God, what if people think that I'm bad? And then I was like, you know, if you spend your life not doing what you want because you're worried about what other people think, and it, I guess it kind of goes back to the thing that people – probably don't like you anyway not everyone but you know what I mean like if you're trying to people please there'll still be people that don't like you because you're always going to be too much for some people and not enough for other people so really like the important thing is that you do what you want to do because then you meet people who are like you or who do want you to do well or who do believe in you and also a lot of these jobs whether it's DJing TV presenting but it could be anything it could be like that you want to be a politician or a barrister or you know one person so say the person doing your job interview they might not like you but they are not the whole world and so sometimes it's being like okay well that it's, it's a shame that 
the decision came down to that one person because everything's mm -hmm. subjective, but that one person moves jobs and suddenly there's a new person in and they might like you. So there's so many times in this industry that I could have stopped. Um, even, you know, when I first got somebody to send my showreel to a presenter who's still on TV, um, it was like a friend who knew him. And I said, oh, can you send, can you send my showreel and uh, ask for advice? And the guy replied saying, my advice is to tell her not to quit her day job. <laughs> and, you know, that really stung at the time. But had I listened to him and his opinion, I would never have, like, had the career that I've had or continued to be doing the career I had. So I think sometimes you have to believe in yourself. And you mm. also have to believe that for a lot of people, they don't like you doing something like that because maybe that was always their dream and they didn't pursue it so they're actually like they don't want to see you do it because then it kind of shines a light on the fact they didn't do it or or they might just genuinely not get it it's like with my you know with my dad he just wants me to get a normal job because he doesn't understand that I'm probably earning more than I would in that normal job mm. but it it's outside of his understanding of what it is that I do and you can't I guess my other thing is that if you see one person doing something no matter what it is whether it's prime minister or you know whatever it is you want to do if that person has achieved it why can't you and that's what i hope to raise my kids believing that no matter what it is it might you know my boyfriend works in in tech so by all accounts he has a normal job but he loves it he wakes up every day and he loves doing that whereas like for me that would be my worst nightmare and for him doing what i do is his worst nightmare but mm. The important thing is that if you love what you do, then it, you know it's not a chore, and you put more passion into it. And the more passion you have, the more likely you are to succeed and get to that next step. Mm. Do you think sometimes you have to make a difficult decision of sort of separating yourself from those real close friends and family, like you know your family as an example? Be, be, you know, to, to to go, not to say that you shouldn't continue to love and support them, but but in order to sort of go for what you've got, you you have to kind of make a bit of a cut off from probably people that are close to you um yeah well I guess it's like in any field it's just protecting your energy um so you know if there's people that doubt you and also some people need to actually see things to believe them like obviously my parents are super proud of me whilst they don't understand it but I had to like show them that I could do it for them to believe it but that's not mm. to say that they'd ever like wish me bad or it was ever toxic they just didn't didn't get it so I think you can like protect your dreams and protect your energy and for sure if people are constantly putting you down they're probably not people that you're going to want to like have on your speed dial to call mm. when you get rejected mm. um but yeah I mean I guess it's like any any job or any part of life like you're gonna choose to hang out with the people who support you and want the best for you as opposed to the people that shoot you down and you know sometimes that's your close friends and family but there's I think you know hopefully anyone watching this is like do you know what I might not get what my kid or my boyfriend or my friend's dream is but I just want them to do well and I want them to be happy so I'm going to support them more mm. and what it, what it was your experience being for in, in terms of peer groups have you as you've gone on have you had to sort of search out other I suppose mentors or people that can kind of advise you as you've progressed throughout your career has that been an important part or have you just you know sort of had your own network that's that's been able to sort of evolve with you um a little bit of both i've definitely got like um you know like a core few friends that have seen me throughout the years but i also had people that you know when i started doing what i did didn't like it so a lot of my university friends um i like stopped speaking to them just because they like they just didn't really get it at all and also a lot of people don't like change and I always say to anyone that I find it very interesting when people say like you've changed as if it's a negative thing because I would really hope that from when I was 16 or from when I was 18 that I've changed because who wants to stay the same person like we're all evolving and it's also completely understandable and acceptable that like sometimes people grow and they grow together and sometimes mm. people end up on completely different ends of the spectrum and at university I was you know, I was, I was, I'm was, i very academic, so I was pursuing that academic life. And I think also from school, I was like a little bit of a misogynist. So I really believed that women had a choice, that you were either academic and you chose that route or you were like pretty and, 
you know, you like makeup and celebrity culture and all of those things. So I think because when I transitioned and when my career kind of took me down that more sort of like wearing makeup and looking good and, uh, you know, a lot of my university friends are like, oh, I thought she hated all of that. But, you know, you're young and you have a lot of prejudices and stereotypes and um, I think it's okay to change your mind. And like, especially as a woman, I would say that it's okay to realise that you can be both of those things and you don't have to choose and especially in a in an industry like DJing it's incredibly misogynistic but that kind of like makes me want to prove my skills even more you know I love it when I turn up to the decks and they almost want to like help me set up and I'm like I've got this <laughs> but um you know it's part of the challenge yeah I I know but like I've been happily married now for for over 10 years and I guess one of the things the same with uh, you know relationships with friends and colleagues is is you also have that situation with with your partner where you can either I suppose change together or or, or change apart I, I know you've you've uh, you know you've, you're in a, a, a relatively new relationship is that some of the things that you look at or you've looked at to say you know well when I when searching for a partner you know I, I need to find someone that's going to be able to sort of grow and evolve with me as opposed to sort of you know stay where they were when we met what, what's your thoughts on that yeah I think it's like supporting someone else's happiness but also um you know I was single for six years before I met my now boyfriend and so I feel like in that time I developed a pretty good understanding of who I am what I like what I don't like and I couldn't be in a relationship with someone who depended on me for their happiness or depended on me to do everything with and I think you know he's out now with friends and we you know I don't I don't have like I couldn't be with someone who wouldn't give me the freedom to see my friends when I wanted or go traveling with friends instead of them and he's uh, very similar to that so I think it is with friends family and um, relationships it's about having those boundaries where you want the best for each other you support each other um you're constantly like pursuing happiness however that may change but you're not completely dependent on each other as a source of happiness because I think that's when you can become very codependent or jealous or worried about someone leaving you behind yeah yeah absolutely so just as we wrap up a couple of questions then so um so what what what's next um, for you? You know, I, I know you've uh, you've got got a number of things going on in your career, um, and also you've got a you've got a sort of a, a new addition on, on the way. You know, what's 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 your plans for the next next few years? Have you got any? You, you sound like you're a very ambitious person with goals. Have, have you got any, or are you just at that stage where like you're you're going to sort of see see how things unfold? Do you know what? It's a funny one because I'm very ambitious, but when people always ask, like, what's your five-year goal or what's this? I always say, like, just want to be happy. And if I'd have made a five-year plan two years ago or a year ago, a baby would definitely not have been in that. So now I think I would have been like, oh, this isn't in the plan. How am I going to do this? So um, I like to follow... There's this really good book called Who Moved My Cheese? And I think um, lockdown and a global pandemic has been like the perfect example of um, of like kind of putting this into practice. So you can have all the goals you want, not just professionally, but even, you know, I could say like in five years time, I want to be married or in five years time, I want to have a baby. But there's so many factors that could come in where you don't get the cheese because someone could leave you, someone could cheat on you. You might not be able to have children you might get fired from your job a global pandemic might come and there might be no dj gigs anymore so i think it's just about like living every day to your full potential like i never want to go to bed and think oh i was meant to do this and i didn't do it because so i kind of have a bit of a long-term goal so to speak in where i want to take djing in where i want to take tv and like every day i just do what i can but equally in by this time next year who knows when i'm a mum, i might not actually find that DJ makes me happy because I might not want to go to festivals or <laughs> tour around the world when I've got a baby or maybe I do but I think um one of my goals I'd say like I'm quite a stubborn character and one of like my big goals is proving that you don't have to just be a mum or like sacrifice who you are or your dreams to be a parent and so I'm really excited to you know keep thriving in 
whatever it is that makes me happy, whether that's like TV or music and obviously be the best mum that I can be. But I, I feel like for me, it's important not to just become a parent. Like I, I want both of us to have that, still have that kind of like independence and freedom whilst being realistic to the fact that life is about to change <laughs> and I'll get much less sleep than I currently get. Absolutely. Yeah, great, great philosophy there, Ashley. Um, so final question, um, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you and others have believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. So outside of what we've, what we've recently spoke about, what would be a memorable example of, of escaping your own personal limits? Um, so for me, it would be um, about being, believe it or not, naturally a bit shy and also being a bit of a control freak. So a few years ago, I just decided to go solo traveling around Mexico by myself for eight weeks. And that really took me out of my limits because I couldn't control anything because obviously I didn't know what was around the corner. But also I couldn't depend on friendship groups or people knowing who I was as like a celebrity. So I had to just kind of like go out there and meet people and push past all my fears and all my old controlling habits. And, um, you know, I think anything that you can do that takes you out of your comfort zone, that's where you, that's where growth is. Fantastic. Well, Ashley, some some wonderful advice there for, for a lot of us. Um, I'm, I'm certainly going to go back and <laughs> make a few of those notes. It's uh, woke me up a little bit. So um, thank you so much for, for your time today. I, I wish you all the success in the future. And um, yeah, th thanks for joining us uh, today on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.